Hi, everyone. Um, some of this will be repetitive, but as a reminder, feel free to engage in conversation with other participants in the chat widget in the chat window in Whova. If you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A window. The presenter will either answer them during the presentation or live after the video if time allows. This session is being recorded and will be available at a later date on the Code for Lib YouTube channel. The first presentation in this session will be Thinking Beyond the Basics of Accessibility by Dr. Kate Dybul. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Kate Dybul, otherwise known as Medikiki on Twitter and Slack. Uh, there will be some messages about this uh, talk and some additional information going out on the various conference channels as I begin. So today I'm talking about thinking beyond the basics of accessibility. But before that, I want to give a land acknowledgement to the Onondaga Nation, firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, uh, the indigenous people on whose ancestral land Syracuse University and its people now stand, sit, walk, and roll. We're, we respect all abilities here. So this is my seventh code for lip. I started in 2015, and that makes me an old timer. And as an old timer, I've talked quite a bit about accessibility issues over the years. I gave a lightning talk my first year as a newcomer on keyboard accessibility. So you newcomers should definitely do a lightning talk. Um, I have also given talks about accessible search result catalogs, uh, accessibility reviews of websites that many librarians like to use, and talked last year about text formats and, and what their various accessibility strengths and weaknesses are. And in general, when I've been choosing these topics, these have been topics that both interested me, but were also important nuggets I felt every library technology person could benefit from hearing. Now this year though, I'm gonna admit that I'm being pretty selfish. I'm focusing only on an accessibility topic that interests me and it's been a long running one. One that I've actually been interested in since my days as a doctoral student, looking for a thesis topic. Of course, I didn't get to work on it because nobody back in 2005 envisioned that we would have this massive ecosystem of mobile portable technologies and we'd be reading on them. Yeah, no, nah, could have listened to me, but nope. But just to go on is like, the reason why I'm focusing just on something that I'm interested in is I'm trying to address some critical burnout that's happening to me right now. And what's going on is though that I'm getting pretty burnt out on accessibility advocacy and I'm not alone in this. This past year has been great in terms of more and more people realizing the importance of accessibility, particularly due to the increased virtual interactions we've been going through. But the problem is though, we're seeing the same things we have always had to say as accessibility advocates. Use descriptive alt text in your images. Please start using headings to mark up your document. It helps so much in so many ways. Don't mess around with ARIA unless you understand what's going on. Studies have shown that websites that, that utilize ARIA tend to have up to 60% more errors in them than sites that don't. So be careful with it. And most importantly, AI subtitles are not a replacement for human written captioning. Yeah. So really, we have such a long way to go in terms of basic accessibility compliance. And it's aggravating because last May, WCAG 1.0, the first specification for web accessibility guidelines turned 21. It can now legally drink in the United States. It's been drinking in other countries for a while too, but it can now even legally drink here. And that is exhausting because it's not only that we're having to repeat ourselves, there are these complex topics, advanced issues that we know exist that we should be and could be working on, but we can't because we're having to do this basic advocacy. So I'm gonna take a few moments to talk about one of these topics that really, really interests me and one that goes back to my doctoral days. I'm going to be talking about accessibility around collaboration, particularly collaboration with documents. So let's take a look on how document accessibility typically works now in the library. So we typically have a book, you know, some, some form of text. A document could be print, digital, could be an article. And then we have a patron. In this case, the patrons here are going to be represented by cute pictures of people's pets. So Fiona here is a cute tuxedo cat. She has limited visual acuity, 
has an executive functioning disorder, meaning that she needs support with organization. And the combination of these disabilities tends to mean that she really prefers listening to her texts and actually asks for them to be transformed into MP3s separated by either major chapter or section so that it's organized a little bit easier for her to use. Now, it might turn out that there is actually a third person involved in this, such as myself, so an accessibility librarian. Here I am not represented by a pet image. I'm represented by the avatar I use, which is a cartoon version of my bespectacled brunette geeky self. And my role in this is actually uh, to pretty much assist with the patron being able to access the text. So I might be doing the remediation of it. I might be assisting them with their assistive technology, either recommending better tools or helping them configure it. But, function, but ultimately, I am leaving them alone to how they work with it. So is this document collaboration right? That ends in it. Diana and I are not doing a shared task over the text. Document collaboration is when multiple people discuss and work around a common text. And this is actually a very common action. Book clubs are actually one of the most common forms of it, where a group of people read and discuss the same book, be it fiction or nonfiction. We have research groups where people are constantly working over published materials, their own reports, everything. And in businesses, we have committees. This is not unique to just the university or academia. This in our information society, collaborating over documents is pervasive. And the implications of this is that what happens when you start to introduce accessibility and disability concerns in, into one of these groups? So you might think, what happens when one person has a disability? And I'm gonna tell you, you're thinking wrong there. The actual question you should ask is, what happens when one or more persons in the group has a disability? What happens when they have different access or technology needs? And in particular, what if those different needs interact or interfere with each other? What do you do then? What is needed? And the reality is, is that when we're talking about inclusive, accessible document collaboration, we might have a bunch of users, might have all these different pets, cats, dog, a rat, you know, all these, inner, all these people working around a common text and there could be all sorts of interactions involved. So let's just look at some potential ones that could exist. So let's go back to Fiona. As I said, Fiona, she has some limited vision and listens to audiobooks to help with her organizational issues. Now Fiona's gonna be working with Luna, a very cute uh, brown hound dog with definitely puppy dog begging eyes. She also has low vision but she uses a screen reader and thus requires a fully remediated electronic version of the text, such as a PDF or EPUB 3. Now, in terms of interaction, where they're going to start running into problems is, is that Luna, because she is actually working with the text, can actually refer to specific pages, sentences, paragraphs, columns, all sorts of things like that. Fiona is listening to just the audio version and doesn't have access to the source text. So therefore, she's actually not gonna be able to necessarily go to the same places that Luna is referring to. Their collaboration is going to be muddled because of that. Now, in terms of a solution for this, there are basically, this song doesn't exist yet, but basically we need better talking book technology that both has access to the underlying text source but also supports executive functioning more. The current technology screen readers, you know, tools that read PDF aloud typically are just focused on that text access, but not necessarily the organizational skills around that. Let's go to another interaction here. Now we're gonna introduce Tess. Tess is a, a gray fluffy cat with uh, light green eyes. She has dyslexia, meaning that her reading is a little bit more labored and slow, but she also has a very strong glare sensitivity. So she definitely does not prefer reading off of electronic screens and tends to print out everything. And often to support her dyslexia, she has found that certain fonts and other type of graphical settings help. Now we also have Fluffernutter, who is another cat, but she's a very light creamsicle cat with gorgeous blue eyes. She has weak vision and difficulty also sitting up for a long period of time. So she uses magnification and works off of a tablet. So, you know, an iPad, Windows Surface, something like that. And so she's constantly zooming in on the text. Now there's gonna be several interaction issues here. 
One is, is that Tess's printed out text is going to be laid out different than fluffer nutters. And so they're going to be constantly like, they're going to be on different pages and everything. And line breaks are going to be different. And even like, you know, reference points when you might say it's like near the top of this page or next to that picture of a frog, because apparently there's a picture of a frog in this, they will be, you know, they're, they're not going to have that shared context to be working with. Fluffer Nutter is also going to be working with a much smaller contextual frame because Fluffer Nutter, I'm sorry, Fluffer Nutter is a boy, I keep forgetting that. Fluffer Nutter is um, just focused in on that. So, you know, what solutions can we need here? One, um, for tests, we definitely need improved e-text displays that cut down on glare sensitivity, but also allow for more customization. Uh, Kindle Paperwhite is pretty good, but in terms of its accessibility features, it's pretty limited, just as Amazon's always been kind of weak on that side. Better typesetting algorithms that can help keep figures and text sections together will also address some of these issues. But then there's also features such as in EPUB 3 that are good about marking and exposing original page breaks. These can be exposed in there and they're really valuable for helping people who are working across different you know, formats, print versus uh, digital, you know, be able to refer to pages and everything, but they need to be exposed better. And so there's a lot of user experience work that needs to happen there. And with all this research, 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 this type of interaction is not discussed that much, or if at all. Let's get into one other one here. So here we have Ivy and Wilbur. Ivy is a diluted calico cat with olive tan eyes. ID is hard of hearing and needs captioning. Due to just the knowledge that, uh, you know, getting a human caption is tricky, they can tolerate AI subtitles if necessary, but there's a limit to that. But now we have Wilbur. Wilbur is a chubby white chihuahua with gorgeous dark eyes and you just want to hug him. And Wilbur both has anxiety and a very pronounced stutter. And the two of them feed into each other. So what's going to happen in this interaction? It's, this really isn't necessarily about print access, but more about the actual act of collaboration. IV is going to be frustrated as the AI uh, subtitles are going to struggle with uh, Wilbur's stutter. And Wilbur might actually end up getting, his stutter might actually get exacerbated because he's seeing, he's experiencing both IV's frustration and if he turns on the captions, we'll see that his stutter is even worse. So we're going to get this horrible feedback loop in here. But let's make this even more fun. Let's throw in Dash. Dash is a very cute gray uh, rat. Dash has a heavy Spanish accent and is also has a bit of PTSD from a racist attack in this also great country of the last four years. But Dash here now has even further issues going on. For Dash, Dash is going to be uh, going to hope that nobody says anything about speaking proper English. He knows that the captions were probably going to be, you know, having difficulty with his accent, which will aggravate Ivy more. And so we have all this going on. And this is just an interaction of, you know, pretty much just one technology there. And to be able to work together, they're going to be facing a lot of challenges. Now, there are multiple solutions here. The first is to recognize that text-based chat, which is another means of them communicating would work, but that's largely just a bandage. You know, there's only so much, you know, text-based communication is just not as fast and flowing as conversation can be. But in, involved in this, I was like, there should be better promotion support infrastructure and funding for human provided captioning. If that's actually funded provided, then you want to be running into this. Captioners can often adjust way better and more um, more fluidly to challenges in, in presentation. And there's also too, I will say is that maybe we can improve AI voice recognition. And some things that might be involved with that is actually building up profiles for individual speakers and being able to, and to, to counter those effects where it's like going, oh, Dash has a heavy Spanish accent. That is something we can prepare for and load a different model. Or Wilbur, you know, stuttering. you could like work with that but we need to actually do that. And the researchers and designers need to think about this. Now I'm gonna admit that last one was not necessarily about um, you know, accessibility and document collaboration, but it still has a point is that 
there's a lot of work in accessibility and user experience that over focus on the needs of single users, but doesn't really think about fundamental group tasks. And one of those fundamental group tasks I think about a lot is the collaboration over shared text. Just even chatting is a fundamental task that we're not necessarily thinking fully about, particularly in terms of access to people with disabilities. And yeah, you know, so this is just what I said. And you know, the big thing is too, I wanna to point out, I was only talking about reading documents. None of this had to involve the access issues involved with writing and editing a document. The great fact is we're ignoring so many multiple technical technology interactions and meeting user needs, especially in the case of disability access. The interaction scenarios I presented are fairly hypothetical. They occur today and will occur more and more. And accessibility advocates and researchers can begin addressing these needs now, but they need the time and opportunity to do so. On how you can help is learn the basics of accessibility, adopt them into regular practice, and ask questions of new technology. Ask if AI subtitles, captions will actually be sufficient. And more importantly, do not discount the lived experiences of disabled people. Aim for more than minimal accessibility standards. Go way beyond what 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 can demand, and learn. Continue to learn. Thank you. Now, before I open up for questions, I just want to address something, a few things, real quick. One, you might actually have some problems by using photos to portray disabled people, particularly given that you might say, "Oh, that's saying that disabled people are subhuman." I'm going to admit that a lot of social and medical stigma tends to actually treat disabled people uh, otherwise. That's been my experience. Instead, I want to point out the pet images prove the point that disabled people are important parts of many people, people's lives, greatly loved by their family and friends, and are exceptionally cute. Yes, that's the case. And so I want to just thank the people who donated their pictures. I had a lot more that I couldn't fit in. And I just want to add one final thing, a little bit of sad news. You might have noticed that my frequently featured cat, Francie, once in among the pets featured in this talk. Sadly, last year, the cat that starred in my first ever accessibility talk at Code for Lib as the keyboard accessibility no mice spokes cat, um, she sadly passed away shortly after Code for Lib. She was a great cat, very loved and very missed. But I have another cat in my life. Fiona is my new tuxedo partner in life, and she is definitely a different character, but I love her, and she's a snuggle bug. So let's open up for questions, and as usual, feel free to talk with me about accessibility issues in libraries whenever, you know, you can reach me. So let's open up. I have about Um, I believe Kate was answering questions um, as we went, but there was one um, that came in uh, just now that says, dumb question, but hopefully easy to answer. How much does live captioning cost? You're on mute, Kate. So, sorry about that. Um, live captioning costs can vary a lot by quality and response rates. The fact that a lot of these are now done remotely, like Code for Lib is doing this year, has lowered the rates. Um, generally, the ones that we use for our own remote cart is usually we get a rate of about $20, $25 an hour, but it depends really on how intense it's going to be. And there are different prices. And there are actually some mechanical Turk uh, microeconomic approaches, but then you have to face those there. I'll look up and uh, share some uh, references on it. It's been a little while since I've actually had to do one because we haven't <laughs> really been putting on programming in the libraries for some reason. And then the other question, you mentioned that you might need more time to think about this, but I didn't know if you wanted to address it. It says, um, can you talk about what your job is like as, as, as an accessibility librarian? We struggle with things like captioning videos at MPOW because it takes time to do it well, but I would think that being part of one's, one person's job has so much potential to be abused. Oh, 
Eh, let's just say if you've noticed me grousing at all during some of this, it's, there are some strong reasons for that. And the big thing is that, that accessibility should not be the, the, the uh, sole responsibility of one person, particularly when it comes to like videos. I can attempt to caption my colleagues videos of like when they go out and teach in a class, but if it's business, architecture, you know, topics I don't know about, then that's, I might not be able to truly identify what is the proper term there. Or if it's definitely a topic that I have no knowledge about, you know, if anything sports related would be good or music. <laughs> I cannot understand anything about music. So you really need that, that domain expertise to help out with that. And one of the things that's good about it, if you use the same captioning service regularly, they'll build up some local expertise and they'll go, oh, I've worked with them before. I know their weird words. They say things like Ferber. Okay, there is another question, okay. but in for the sake of time, um, it's yep. time to move on to the next one. But thank you, Kate. And um, this is a great session, so keep uh, listening. Thank you all. Um, so the next, let me, um, the next session um, is uh, Ethics and Web Design by Amy Dreyer. And I will turn it over to Amy. Greetings. My name is Amy Dreyer. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am a web developer for the University of Minnesota. Uh, for folks who cannot see, I will describe myself. I am a Caucasian woman with long brown curly hair in a dark gray and black sweater. I have a plain beige wall with two doors behind me. I've had a few opportunities to consider ethics in web design while working on IT and library solutions for the US Army, as well as academic and public libraries. Minnesota is located on the traditional and contemporary homelands of the Anishinaabe and Dakota peoples, a territory violently seized from these original stewards who still reside alongside us. Additionally, the treaties made between sovereign tribal nations and the US have not been honored. The failure to honor our treaties must be rectified. We acknowledge the trauma embedded in this country through past and present actions. And we affirm the right of people to bring their whole selves and stories into this space. Why is this statement important? The work we do on the web is for people and people are complex with a broad range of lived experiences and inherited stories. They experience privilege and oppression, recognizing the injustices in our past and present help us to recognize how they manifest in our work and perspectives. And we can focus on building technologies that improve the experience of all people. So what is ethical web design? This isn't going to be a deep dive into philosophical semantics and theorizing, though there's certainly a place for that in this conversation. Many of us here are doing ethical work on the web, whether we've considered it as such or not. Sometimes we just know it's the right thing to do. So to answer our question, what is ethical web design? Simply put, ethical web design is designing for the well being of the person consuming the content. This works for my understanding for applying some practical practices. In your journey, you may develop a different understanding or perspective of what ethical may mean in your web work. For me, when I first started playing on the web, it was literally that. We were playing, exploring, and experimenting with what we could do. There wasn't much thought about other people seeing that work or how they might experience it. Uh, we started to take into consideration different device sizes and capabilities, but with a browser as consumer model rather than a person as consumer need. We build because we can. We don't often ask why or should we, but as Mike Montero said in a 2013 presentation, 
This is how bad design makes it out into the world, not due to malicious intent, but having no intent at all. The web is ready to mature. We're seeing where the lack of real intent or established ethics is failing us as an industry and frankly, as a civilization. And we're starting to see this work happening. I break down ethical web design into seven primary principles, which is driving our own design system development. They are universally accessible, honest, inclusive, mindful, private, simple, and sustainable. I'll go over these in a little more detail. Universally acceptable, or acceptable, accessible. Deliver content and services where barriers to access are removed for all people to use, regardless of technology, format, or methods of delivery. Avoid building to one way of doing or being. Build to be understandable in a way that allows us to be human and make errors. Honest, be transparent, provide only accurate content written with non-biased language and clearly identify opinionated content. Fight disinformation or the act of intentionally deceiving uh, in content and algorithms. Inclusive, lead with person first design, designing with people, not for them. Be aware of our own biases and assumptions and recognize we are not the user. Embrace people as complex beings where average doesn't exist. Mindful, make decisions that prioritize user well-being. Don't build to steal attention and avoid dark and anti-patterns. The farther you pull someone from their task, the harder it is for them to do it. This is particularly important for cognitive accessibility. Private, promote and ensure privacy through security and personal data ownership. Provide these tenets in systems and services to the best of our ability and be transparent where we cannot. Simple. Simple doesn't mean easy or dumbed down. Simple is challenging. It's curating and cultivating the message concisely and clearly. It's discovering the most elegant semantic technical solution and the intentional use of the resources available. Sustainable. Factor in energy source and consumption for optimizations from server to client side. Just as people do not deserve a reduced experience, our planet does not deserve to suffer the consequences of bad design and web delivery. Sustainability is as much about our planet's well being as it is our own, as they are intertwined. Defining these principles is an organic ongoing process as we explore and better understand this work in practice. If this was your list, what would you have on it? What would you change? Share them if you're comfortable with it. Uh, I'll give everyone a moment or two to think. So as we've been building out designs and thinking intentionally about these principles, I've noticed intersectionalities. I'll share a few next. Our first one is elegant accessibility. David Henka Reed presented on this concept at the Inclusive Design 24 conference. In a nutshell, elegant accessibility means using semantic HTML. Does anyone here know how many HTML 
elements exist in HTML5? It's about 112. How many do you know and use? Widely known secret here. Native HTML has functionality baked in. Functionality that includes accessibility, such as heading elements, the H1 and H2, et cetera, which provides document outline and navigation to jump through the content, improving accessibility by default. Leonie Watson described building a custom link using a span element as needing 80% more code than using the native HTML anchor element because you had to recreate the functionality and styles. Thus, using semantic elements reduces overall complexity. It's a simpler solution. Also, CSS has come a long way. If you're using semantic HTML, you'll have more unique things to point at than adding lots of IDs and classes. You'll need less CSS, less JavaScript, and less HTML. And of course, by using less code, the web page uses less energy. Each bit requires electricity to exist. In UTF-8 encoding, one character can take one to four bytes. Less code will require less electricity to exist on a server and for delivery and consumption. Web pages with less code are likely to be smaller, faster, use fewer resources, and are more sustainable, both to maintain as well as for the planet. Readable content. We want people to read our content, mostly. Uh, in order to have readable content, experts recommend writing at seventh or eighth grade reading levels. Just because some of us can read at a PhD level doesn't mean we enjoy doing so, especially for everything. Use shorter words, wordsmith to simplify the message, and utilize space and content chunking. Writing content isn't so hard. Writing readable content is challenging. By writing for readability, we're making the content more accessible to everyone, but especially to folks with cognitive and learning disabilities. Also follow other typography best practices for appropriate font size, line length, proper spacing and alignment. We're mindful of people's time and attention by writing fewer and smaller words. We're taking the time instead to distill our message so that our readers don't need to use their time doing so. And by using smaller words and a clearer message with fewer words, we are inherently writing with fewer characters. Fewer characters means fewer bytes of data requiring less energy. A clear message makes a sustainable web. And again, both maintenance and planetary health. Good performance is good. Through writing good code, content, and other optimizations, we can improve performance. We make the web more performant for a variety of reasons, but primarily to retain visitors. It's well proven that if the site takes longer than a couple seconds to load, people will leave. An altruistic side effect is sites may also be more available to a wider audience. They may load on more devices with varying connectivity. So it's somewhat more inclusive, though often not intentionally. Because performance sometimes means perceived load time and not the complete load time. Does good performance also mean less energy consumption um, and being more sustainable? A recent paper has confirmed there is a correlation. And Chris Coye, founder of uh, the CSS Tricks website, has suggested we follow the W3C's rule of least power. 
But generally, good performance also often means less energy and more sustainable. Analytical compromises. We like website visit counts. And what better than a comprehensive free tool like Google Analytics? But when have you last used those numbers to create a more meaningful experience for visitors? Jerry McGovern recently published a four part article titled Calculating the Pollution Cost of Website Analytics. He sets one gigabyte of data transmission as 0 0.0042 kilograms of pollution. He calculated the transfer of visitor data, the storage of the data, and processing of it, and found Google would have to plant 3.77 million trees annually to address its carbon impact. The sheer amount of CO2 Google Analytics generates and how the code may slow down website performance, which draws some inclusion concerns, uh, draw sustainability concerns as well. Is this service free? McGovern writes, you think you are getting Google Analytics for free when in fact, Google is using you to track people because selling the data they get from tracking people is how they make 90% of their revenue. Getting these services by selling our visitors data leads to privacy loss and less trust. One last item to ponder. Jerry also wrote recently that nearly 80% of the data we collect, we don't use. And another 10% we don't access after the first three months. Typography selection. There's little evidence that dyslexic design fonts can help a broad audience of people experiencing dyslexia. The readability group confirmed at this year's AxCon conference that dyslexic fonts are not ideal. Some research has, however, uh, shown that the most commonly used typefaces are helpful because of the amount of exposure and so are generally more legible. For copy text, consider using a native or system uh, font set, such as Verdana and Arial, both are sans serif. System and native fonts also do not fail to load over unstable internet connections, which makes them more universal or inclusive. Going with a system or native typeface probably doesn't sound appealing. Using legible custom fonts such as BBC Reef or Public Sans is okay for headings where the text is short, but Consider that modern CSS gives us finer control over spacing and other typographic elements that could refresh common fonts. If we remove one or two custom fonts, that's fewer resources uh, uh, requested over the network. For required custom fonts, you can also remove unneeded styles such as demi bold, which reduces font file size. Reducing resource requests and file sizes means less energy. And finally, dark patterns. From the website darkpatterns.org, dark patterns are tricks used in websites and apps that make you do things that you didn't mean to, like buying or signing up for something. One example is confirm shaming where the option to decline something is worded in such a way as to shame the user into compliance. For example, yes, send me the meal plan, or no thanks, I don't like delicious food. Dark patterns fail nearly all ethical principles. They're often not accessible and can trap keyboard and assistive tech users and can truly disable people with cognitive or emotional impairments. They're often offensive, making them not inclusive, dishonest, they aren't people first, it's unnecessary added code, we cannot trust it. And folks who think these techniques are acceptable aren't building them to be understandable. 
So those are a few of the intersections, but certainly not all of them. Can you think of others? A list of resources is available at z.umn.edu slash ethical dash intersections. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks, Amy. Um, it's time to start the next talk, which will be by Wei Ma and Christina Springfield, um, who will be presenting not just for those students, assistive technology for users with and without disabilities. Hi, welcome. We are uh, my colleague Wei Ma, librarian at California State University, Dominguez Hills, and. I'm Christina Springfield, OER librarian, a former OER librarian at Cal State Dominguez Hills. I'm currently a librarian with Mount San Antonio College. Welcome to our Code for Lib presentation, not just for those students, assistive technology for users with and without disabilities. So this is what we hope to cover in our presentation in terms of summarizing our work over the past two years, working and advancing um, a universal design tool at the university. We're limited in time today, so we're not going to go into depth on any of these points, um, but you can feel free to reach out to us afterwards if you'd like any additional information. Uh, so the tool that we advocated for and marketed at DH is called Census Access, which is an electronic text-to-speech product. It creates an MP3 of readings. Um, and in terms of grounding this in theory, when we consider, you know, this is a tool that's generally marketed to users with a visual disability. Um, but when considering folks with visual disabilities, theorists from the field of disability studies um, posit that the society we live in would consider this to be, you know, a medical condition. We can and we really should reframe um, our understanding of ability as a socially constructed idea. And we really need to consider the needs of all people and build in accessible versions into original platforms as much as possible, rather than building something for the quote unquote typical patron. And this really kind of feeds into, into what we did. Um, overall, the purpose of our study was to market a text-to-speech tool to all users, including those with and without disabilities, uh, provide students with alternative ways of reading, um, helping our students who have very busy schedules uh, utilize their time well and also work with campus partners so as to make the initiative sustainable. We have gone through the literature review and market analysis two times. First time was a few years ago. We found that only a handful of institutions in our analysis offer this service to general users in a library setting. In the last few months, we found many libraries has included assistive technology services on their web page, on the library's web page, for general users in a library setting. However, we have not found that the services was deployed to general users on college campus-wide and how users are used the service. Our project will expand the research by looking at college focus courses, cases, studies, and examining how our general students, faculty, and staff make use of this text-to-speech service. When we initiate the assistive technology service in the library, we encounter the difficulties such as budget shortage, and not enough support, such as equipment support and technology support. We needed funding for software subscription and hardware. Our practice is an example of campus unit collaboration to overcome these issues. We, the library, partner with Campus Student Disability Resources Center and Campus Information Technology Units we found that SDRC does not have enough space to house the AT equipment. So we offer for exchange 
We offer space in exchange for their software subscription support. We, and we also gain support from information technology to help us maintain, install and maintain the software and hardware and also pay for the annual subscription of Texas, a census access text to speech tool. And this is really important on our campus because while we do have a large population of students that have a documented disability, in general, students face huge barriers to being documented in the first place. Um, literature has shown that some of these barriers include an administrative burden to get documented, um, a financial cost, and as well as you know the ongoing stigma. So all of these, you know, these factors have to be considered alongside the other barriers the student may face in, in getting what they need out of their readings, you know, due to the many facets of their intersectional identities. So in discussing, you know, when Wei and I were discussing this tool, you know, we started to talk about all of the different barriers that our students face. Um, our students were likely to be minoritized, uh, Latinx, first generation college students, Pell Grant recipients. Uh, when campus is open, very likely to be commuters, so spending long hours on public transportation or in the car in Los Angeles area traffic. Uh, many work a second or a third job, and many are caregivers. So our job, we felt as librarians, was to try to access, uh, was to increase their access to information. So why wouldn't we market this tool to everyone in a way that destigmatizes the use of an accessibility tool? So here's some examples of our student marketing campaign. Um, as you can see, we designed it to be really friendly and open with simple messaging. We included images of people that looked like our students and that showed them doing you know, normal things in a student's life such as taking public transportation, taking care of a child, going to the gym. And we created different print materials, flyers and bookmarks that we placed around the library as well as around campus and at special events. Uh, we had digital marketing that took place on digital signage around campus, um, as well as on our library's social media channels. We made, made presentations to our student government representatives on the tool. Um, and we also included information, uh, Wei and I, in our information literacy workshops. Also on our list of people to get the word out to included um, learning center representatives, counselors, and advisors. They were a little bit harder to reach. Uh, we reached faculty through direct liaison emails, as well as campus-wide emails. And one thing we wanted to, to mention, after one campus-wide email went out, it really became clear that some faculty, you know, they were a little bit worried about the tool because they thought that they, it promoted a reading style that went against best practice. Um, so, you know, think about intensive reading where students are circling words and underlining concepts, and they worried that students, you know, wouldn't be safe listening to their, to their readings in the car. Um, so there was clearly a disconnect um, between the reading faculty thought students were doing um, and their students' daily lives in terms of what they were able to, to, to do and to manage. So we really wanted to also then develop some marketing materials aimed at faculty um, and market the tool in a way that faculty could appreciate. So one of the things we did was create this LibGuide. Um, it's aimed at faculty and it promoted the tool not as a time saver for students, but as a way to offer alternative learning opportunities. So in that, in that way, we learned our lesson. Next slide is about the census access text to speech usage statistics. Um, in the past two years, from February 1st to December 31st, 2000, um, there were a total of 2,078 uh, usage requests. This usage seems low. However, that's the reason for it to be, to, to be this way. Uh, with the recent technology development, we noticed that text-to-speech function has been included in other services, such as Blackboard has adopted Ally, which has a text-to-speech function. And Adobe X recently made PDF re-allow available on desktop. 
However, both Blackboard Airline and PDF re-allow have a service limit. Blackboard Airline text-to-speech is only available on Blackboard for students who enroll in that class. It becomes unavailable when a student finishes the class. Adobe PDF re-allow is only available on the desktop um, when a user just download it, it becomes unavailable after the PDF has been saved to local drive. Our text-to-speech census access text-to-speech tool is the only tool which is available anytime, anywhere, and it has been welcomed by students, faculty, and staff. Uh, next slide, it's uh, our future direction, what we are planning, next steps. We are, the first thing, we will propose that the library add a link to the library's course reserve page on OPAC. Link, the link will provide students an option to cover from print to MP3. Uh, we have statistics which shows in 2019, the course reserve reading materials uh, mostly in print, 90% of the course reserve materials are in print format. And students has checked out 7,584 times of this print course materials. And the second plan, which we are going to do is that we are going to propose that the library add a link to the full text article site on the article search result page. This link will provide an option for students to convert their digital service to MP3. Students can choose to listen to the article anytime, anywhere, instead of just reading the article. Okay. Yeah. And here's a list if anybody's interested in our references, um, but we really encourage you to think about different ways to incorporate different accessibility tools into your library systems and really think about how to market them to other user populations than you might originally consider. Thank you. Okay, it looks like there's one question and we probably have time to answer um, one question. Um, did you face any copyright challenges or concerns in text uh, to speech adoption? Uh, on our website, we did, um, uh, we, did, uh, we, we did add a link on the text to uh, census access text to speech website. Um, the, a user has to read the copyright um, uh, 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 restrictions and before they can proceed to uh, convert their text. And uh, we didn't include it in this, uh, in this presentation, but if you are interested on the <clears throat> copyright and restriction usage um, for digital media, you can contact us. We, can, we will be happy to share with you, with anyone. And then another question we got way was um, whether the system tracks who is placing requests and or how many requests they're placing to track usage and or check copyright issues. Um, and in terms of this, um, it, it, it asks for their student email, is that correct? Their, their college email? I don't know what what it, are you uh, sorry what is your question again? Oh, I was taking it from the chat. Someone asked if uh -huh. the tool tracks um, who and is placing email. requests. No, we don't. We only collect usage. How many people? Uh, we don't collect uh, the username and where they are connecting. Only connect what they do. Uh, the document they submitted, what kind of a format they request, either PDF or audio or accessibility conversion. We don't check users uh, email or who the user is or the user, user status. Okay. 
Okay, um, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you, Wei and Christina. Um, the next uh, and final session of this block is um, Jason Clark, and he will present Green Digital Libraries, Progressive Web Apps, Sustainable Design and Coding for the Greener Good. Hi, Code for Lib. I'm Jason Clark from Montana State University Libraries, and I'm going to talk today about green digital libraries, progressive web apps, uh, sustainable design, and coding for the greener good. As far as what's ahead, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about research motivation, um, the energy problem statement, where um, that leaves us, what it could mean. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, sustainable software design show a brief sample application and then talk a little further about research implications. <clears throat> so as far as motivation, I started to look around because uh, I want to understand a bit more about how do, how do things like uh, information communications technologies, ICTs uh, impact the uh, impact the world. Uh, and, and really when we think in that frame of environmental, uh, and I bumped into environmental media studies. And actually, um, this particular uh, Hunter Vaughn, who was at the University of Colorado, spoke a lot about the materiality of the virtual. I think this is a really important concept uh, because it starts to draw out what I had seen or understood as kind of invisible those invisible impacts of our online worlds, the worlds we build, the software we use, the devices we use. Uh, so bringing forward that, that materiality seemed like an, a real possibility, a real interesting possibility, especially when we start to apply it to the work that we do with, as Code for Lib, uh, whether it's software, um, devices that we deploy, servers that we run, data centers that we use. Um, I also connected the dots to an earlier uh, study from one of my colleagues, Scott Young, about web performance. And a lot of the things that I talk about in this uh, in this presentation are going to be kind of focused on how the impactful things that we can do to our machines, our servers, our software um, that really help with performance. So there's there's definitely a through line that research. Um, so what's what's the problem? What's the problem that I started to see or that I wanted to understand? Uh, here it is. The materiality of the virtual has a polluting and environmental impact. So I started to look through what does consumption look like? How do you divide it? How do you understand it versus you know, production? energy consumption during production, how, what about it during use? And use is really where I thought we had the opportunity. Um, and I started to under, wanted to understand what it meant for digital libraries in particular. Um, so I used this uh, introductory metric uh, website tool called uh, Website Carbon Calculator and ran it through some of our top level uh, digital collections. Um, this is Digital Public Library of America landing page. Yeah, so uh, there's probably some work there. Then I went to Library of Congress, their collections pages, digital collections pages. So, okay, maybe there is something to this. Um, and I don't bring those examples forward. I bring those examples forward as an opportunity. Um, when we think about possibilities, whether it's performance in general, but just the opportunity for us to have an impact in the way we do our work. Um, the scale of this uh, is much broader than anything I could do um, if I were to think, think, act locally, think globally, these sort of things. Like, uh, the reach of the work we do um, could have a real impact. So 
just thinking through that. And in this frame, I'm thinking of the environment as a potential user, not just the machines that access or not, not a person who's using our information or using our, our digital libraries, but actually the, the, world, the world at large. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk through the sustainable development techniques um, to really get an understanding and, and show some examples of what can we do to, if we're thinking of the environment as a user, um, so I'm going to talk through the systems, the resources, and the code um, that we can apply to be more sustainably responsible when it comes to our, our, our software. Uh, when I say systems, I'm talking about the routines and architecture. Um, and this is more in this, if you need a kind of a, a keyword, it's our sysadmin area. <clears throat> so the first thing we can do is think through compression and the ways that we minimize, um, okay. <clears throat> pull files together, but also minimize them as they move over the, over the network. Um, you can see here, this is an example from the example application. Uh, you can see a gain. Uh, you can see, just, just to illustrate the, the, the gain that you get in compressing things. Um, the other thing uh, within systems, uh, you can think through caching the way that content delivery networks work, where you store your files, um, actually evaluating if a user needs a new file through uh, various timestamping or e-tags. Uh, again, the goal here, all of these uh, sustainable development te techniques have um, an energy efficiency impact. And it's really about minimizing network power, minimizing network and power use. In, within systems, you can also think of hosting. Where do you? Where are your data centers? Where can you invest in greener energy sources? And I linked to uh, the Green Web Foundation has a list of um, hosting and data centers that have um, have certified more towards the green and towards green energy. Uh, and then finally, inside of the sy systems area, um, you can think of sunsetting your resources or your your application. Uh, this would be using analytics, applying local time, and then actually powering down when the software isn't in use or doesn't need or is in limited use. This is an example of a low-tech website that's actually built um, as uh, it's built on solar energy, but as it as it's necessary, it, it turn it turns down, it turns up. Um, pretty fascinating. Uh, the other part of sustainable design is uh, focusing on the resources. Uh, the second part. And really I'm talking about media and materials optimization. This is a uh, software deployment practice and how we push things or package things and make them available in our software or on, on the network. <clears throat> and it's really, uh, in this case, I'm really kind of looking at videos and, and images because those are very, um, they're some of the largest energy users uh, in our applications. Um, so optimization for media, you can see, this is just an example of running it through a particular software tool to minimize uh, or compress those files themselves. Um, see some of the gain there. Another thing to think about inside of the, uh, the resources area is um, what, how can you minify? your files. And this is really not, not just unnecessary characters, but even unnecessary code routines. Um, and you can really uh, uh, apply this to how not only you package the software, but how you write it. Um, the, the really simple example of something like this would be how you compress in a web app, how you compress, you could compress your files, not only compress, but actually minimize it, min minify them. Um, that would be taking out unnecessary tags or spaces and so, and you actually gain a lot of um, the file sizes shrink significantly. Um, finally, inside of the uh, resources area, I wanna talk about uh, technical SEO. Uh, if you can use other sites and I running the Google through that website carbon calculator, these are very efficient sites. Um, and if you can, use your indexing and motion of your sites inside of other sites that are gate, gateway sites or um, bridge sites to your information. Um, 
that's another form of energy efficiency. So things like how do, you, how do you allow them to crawl index? How can you put structured data on a page that allows that secondary or access to happen? Finally, I'm gonna to turn towards code uh, uh, as a sustainable design or sustainable development technique. Um, and really I'm talking about how we write our code, how we think about our code, how we organize our code. Um, I call it defensive programming. I think I'm gonna amend that a little bit more later. Um, but in, this, in these examples, I'm just gonna show some possible if kind of scenarios where you could watch for a particular device or user um, environment and pull, you know, build your programming routine around that. So and sometimes you can look for memory. You can, um, in this case, these are web APIs uh, within the browser, um, but you could do this server side as well. If you um, look at access logs and information that are co that's coming over uh, as people are, are using your, your, your software. You can look at things like CPUs and processing uh, just to understand what's available uh, on a on a look on a user's device or a, or a machine. Uh, you can understand where they are in the power cycle itself. You can understand if they're charging or if they're in a low battery. Uh, moreover, you can look at things like serving dark mode, uh, which is another very efficient way of uh, not as um, on a white screen, pushing pushing lots of blue light across uh, across the network, or, or demanding uh, demanding that that light be uh, and be processed. And the uh, the CSS has a prefers color scheme now that allows you to do this. Um, the the one other thing you can do is you can actually understand how people are using your your interface and push information as they need it. So it sort of just sits there latent and then moves into the user interface as it's needed. Um, this is called lazy loading. Um, there's an intersection observer API and then various tags that you can use in the web app. Finally, uh, in this section, uh, the code that I, that I um, the coding practice, uh, progressive web app uh, is, is a, a practice that um, uses a certain kind of architecture um, that allows you to install uh, various other things. The, but I want to what I want to really draw your attention to is that there is a, I talked about caching at the server level at the systems level. Um, you can also do this within your code to understand. You can so you get uh, the service worker inside of a PWA actually caches information. So what about that sample application? If we looked at, so that, as we started to pull this together um, to understand what it would mean um, if we pulled together green software architectures and this group, um, the MSU dataset search group, which was led by Sarah Mannheimer, uh, our data librarian at Montana State University Libraries, uh, really wanted to kind of pull a lot of these, these ideas into a singular um, example. And so we pulled all of the things that I talked about from the systems, from the resources, and from the code itself into this green software architecture. And so what did we find? We found that, uh, lo and behold, there are results. Um, so not only uh, performance-wise in Scott Young's formulation, a better experience for users and machines, but also a better experience for the environment. Um, here's another example, uh, green, the green IT uh, browser extension actually um, allows you to, to look at a couple other metrics. So the call I'm putting forward to all of us today is to think uh, differently about our DevOps um, and empathetic DevOps, but not only that, DevOps that actually allow our code to connect to a social good. Um, if, if the way you're able to justify performance is because it's green, um, you can do that. You can do that now. 
also creates a different kind of role for us. And what this does is it creates digital libraries for everyone, lightweight computing practices, green digital libraries, discoverable, accessible on any device. Thank you. Okay, it looks like there were a couple of questions that came in. Um, the first one is um, RE compression. How does the footprint um, created by the CPU power usage in the act of file compression compare to the efficiency gained in transmission? And has this been quantified slash storage? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. Um, I can turn on my camera. <clears throat> Uh, yes, yeah, so this question came up and the uh, there is the one time cost of uh, I think what I'm understanding the question is about, you have to use energy to compress something before you put it over the wire so you're not you're, you're, you're still using some form of energy but it's a one time use that um, what I what I found in a lot of this research, which I think is uh, really just getting its footing. Um, the quantifications are starting to be there, uh, but I'm not sure if that particular metric is in place as far as like cost benefit of do the work at the beginning, compress things, or um, like what do, what do you gain overall? Um, so I'm not, I, so the, the, the answer is it hasn't been quantified yet, but scholars like Hunter Vaughn and um, a number of other environmental media scholars are starting to do work to really pull these metrics um, up to, to make them more clear. Um, there's also one, one article that I linked to in the slides, which I'll, I'll send to the, group, to the group about um, measuring like server load uh, using a particular power API um, piece of software to kind of watch uh, what you gain in, in, in doing some of this compression and caching work. Does that, does that help? I can't see people. So. Yeah, it's, um, I, I, there, so there's one more question. Is there <laughs> solid data on how much difference dark mode makes on modern monitors to power usage? Um, I haven't seen it yet. I just know that it's, um, it's, it's a, because it is, um, it's not using the, the direct blue light and pushing as much energy through the screen. Um, it does have it. And again, these, these studies are just starting to kind of stand up. Um, so I think we'll see more and more uh, as we go forward. It was kind of, it was this amazing rabbit hole as I kind of started to look into um, and wanting to understand where these metrics are. And um, so, it, so um, I don't have them off on the top of my head, but some of the resources will probably point to that. And um, I'm happy to, uh, like I said, this is a rabbit hole. I'll probably be in for a little while just to kind of understand it a bit more. Um, okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks to all of the presenters um, in this um, section. Um, and I just have a few announcements before we uh, wrap up um, for the day. So, um, and before the um, kind of after conference festivity, festivities start. So um, do you have an idea, a project or a practice that you would like to share with the community? Um, sign up for a quick five minute lightning talk. We will have a well, lightning talk session once a day. So for the next two days, um, link, the link for the lightning talks and breakout room signups will be shared in the Code for LibCon Slack channel. So look for that in Slack. Um, tonight, um, we're taking our traditional board gaming night online and we hope you can join us. There are plenty of platforms and games to choose from. You can run a game or play a game. You can sign up for hosting or playing a game in the Google Doc linked in Whova. Um, suggested start time for those organizing games is 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. And um, you should be planning ahead. Sign up to sing a song or two at karaoke night using the Google form posted in the virtual meets thread on the Whova community board. Thursday evening, we have partnered with the DC-based District Trivia to bring you trivia to bring trivia night to you. Code for Libbers will be randomly placed into teams to compete for bragging rights. Space is limited in this event, so please register in advance through the Zoom registration link in the virtual meets thread on the Whova community board. And I'd just like to say thanks again to all of our presenters. <laughs>